Hi everyone, thanks very much for coming along to Yes Southside's latest public Zoom meeting. Um, we're really looking forward to this one. Um, Francis Curran, former Scottish Socialist Party MSP and Gavin Bruith um, have uh, asked to come along and agreed to come along and give us a presentation on the resurrection um, and rebirth of um, Socialists for Independence, who uh, we obviously know will be an important element of the upcoming Indy Ref 2 campaign. Uh, so I appreciate everyone who has taken time out to join us this evening. Uh, it's live streamed on Indy Live, as some of you will know, and also on our Yes Southside Facebook page. Uh, so there'll be catch up facilities available as well. Uh, I'm just going to hand you over to uh, Jane, who will give you a wee bit of um, background to how the evening is going to operate in terms of the uh, chat and asking questions, etc. So uh, thanks a lot, everyone. And Jane, I'll pass it over to you. OK, thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to show a video just now from Socialists for Independence and then Francis and Gavin will, uh, will do a wee talk. Um, after that, uh, I, you can either put your hand up on reactions or put in the chat any questions and I can read them out if you don't want to read them out. And there's also, there'll be messages coming in from India Live as well and I'll read them out. So if you just bear with me, I'm just going to um, share my screen. Okay, and play this video. Are you okay, everybody? I was eight years old when the Scottish Parliament here was first born. For my generation, it's time to move on. It's time for Scotland to become a fully independent country. In Socialists for Independence, we'll work constructively to make that happen. We want to be part of a yes movement that is both united and diverse. If we stand together, we'll be unstoppable. That'll be a new dawn, the start of an exciting journey towards a new Scotland. One that will turn its back on the warped values of Boris Johnson's United Kingdom. Last year in Britain, while people were mourning their dead, losing their livelihoods and terrified about what the future might hold, 171 billionaires, that's less than a third of the people living in this set of flats here, earned more than 107 billion in wealth accumulation. That's more than three times the Scottish Parliament's annual spending budget. All the while, four million children across Britain and in areas like this were living in poverty. During these dark days, the people who kept us safe and well were not the billionaire bankers and speculators. It was hospital workers, care workers, delivery drivers, bin workers and other low-paid workers and unpaid carers who braved the pandemic to keep the wheels turning. The independent Scotland that we want to build will look after those that look after us. We'll value what's important and devalue the culture of capitalist greed. We need people to believe in the kind of country that Scotland can be. Recently here on the south side of Glasgow, we saw a glimpse of a better future. A community that stood together and defended its own and displayed the best of Scotland. Courage, compassion, solidarity, tolerance, humanity. Fifty years ago, in July 1971, 8,000 workers on the banks of the Clyde made history when they refused to accept the closure of the five shipyards that lined the river. For a full year, they took control of the upper Clyde shipyards into their own hands. They inspired John Lennon to write Power to the People. They inspired the whole world with a vision of how things could be done. A clean, green, nuclear-free, independent Scotland that challenges prejudice and bigotry, scrapping the trade union laws, ending poverty pay and homelessness, taxing the rich and redistributing wealth. Just imagine the resonance that would have across Europe and beyond. An independent Scotland with a socialist vision could light not just a candle, but a bonfire.
Okay, over to you, Francis. Oh. Just seven years ago, Scotland voted in a referendum to stay mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Thanks, Jane. I'm impressed at your techie skills, by the way, streaming on Facebook as well. Thanks very much to Yes Southside for inviting me and Gavin along. Um, and it, hopefully at some point we'll get to see each other in person. But I'm also mindful that we're meeting tonight to talk about Scottish independence when, you know, bombs are raining down on children and women and the towns and cities of Ukraine. And we're seeing the horrors of that war every night on our screens. And I think it puts in context some of the discussion that, that we're having. Um, I think most days, I mean, Ukraine is a sovereign nation invaded by a foreign army. And I think most years are still working at ways that how to do solidarity, how to actually concretely help. And uh, I hope we continue to, to try and do that throughout it. But tonight's discussion is about Socialists for Independence. So why Socialists for Independence? Um, it was a discussion that started a year probably in the making of just talking to people to say, we need a space to discuss ideas and um, we're all pro-independence. And eventually emerging out of that into a kind of public space uh, last November, just as the COP26 took place. And it's still very much kind of a developing network, group, organisation, whatever you want to call it. And we have got some sort of ideas about how to develop it. But we said, look, we'll do it for six months and then we'll have a look and then we'll see where we're at and what kind of grouping or network that we, we think we need. We've all got in common that we want to win independence and we want a future referendum and we want to win it. We want to win the right to a referendum and then we want to win a referendum because the opportunity to build a new society totally different from the, the society that we live in now is what inspires us. And I think it's what inspired people in the last, um, that hope, that possibility was what inspired us. A lot of us anyway in the last interest that. It was carried in in the winds um, to the, the town centres and to the, the city centres. I mean, that last Saturday, by the way, in, before the referendum in Buchanan Street Steps, I know it's Glasgow, so I'm allowed to say that, was just the most wonderful thing, the connection, the way people felt. Um, so. We also think that there's many different voices. There's no one group of people or one political party that's going to win a referendum. There has to be many voices, and we want to be part of a diverse yes movement. We understand the central role of the SNP and the Greens in both delivering the, re the referendum and then the role that they'll play in winning the referendum. They're absolutely central to that. But we also recognise that there's lots of people who don't necessarily identify with those parties. And there's there's many people who are yet to be convinced who don't identify with the parties. And there's many people who are in the movement who don't. And I think that has to be acknowledged as well. And that's why that's where we think we can particularly reach to convince people and to persuade people to commit and vote and to be engaged in the campaign, particularly in working class communities. I mean, those that are involved in Socialist for Indy, forefront and back have behind the scenes, I've been involved in a lot of campaigns in working class communities, you know, knocking doors or occupying community centres or all sorts of saving schools, that type of thing. And so we've got some experience there and we think that's what we can bring. At the heart of the aims, we've got five aims that we produce to kind of organise around, is freedom. We've used the word freedom quite deliberately and includes independence, the freedom for us to decide our future. That was not up to anybody else. We've got on equality, on ecology, on community, and in socialism as well. And the socialist bit, the last one, is the freedom to own and control our own resources for the benefit of the people who live here and for future generations. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. That's the kind of society that we want. And the membership of Socialist for India is open to um, socialists of all parties and none. And I think that's important because there's been too much division in the Yes movement. You know, we need some unity if we're going to win this and convince an entire population that, that this is a good idea and that we can construct something really positive and constructive. But we're posing the question as our part of the Yes movement, well, what's the point in winning our freedom as an independent nation if you then hand over your wealth and your resources 
to a global wealthy elite, to the multinationals, to the corporate banks? What is the point in winning independence? Is it no a possibility to do something completely different? And it links to the question that the young protesters, the young climate change protesters were raising on COP26. Because what they're saying is we're going to have to live differently. You know, if we're going to save the planet, then we're going to have to radically change the way in which our societies work and the way that we live in order to create a sustainable Scotland. And I believe that Scotland could be that sustainable country. I teach politics. And the one thing I can guarantee you, the only thing I can guarantee you is that political systems change and they change all the time. So the idea that we couldn't change our political and economic system is just mince, frankly. And nobody knows anything. We'll go back to the book, the textbook. And so there's a possibility there. And I think the young people can see that as well. But how do we do it? And I think what's clear coming out of COP26 is you can't control what you don't own. It's as simple as that. That's why essentially there wasn't any um, agreement to, that's going to help um, the temperatures of the planet come down coming out of COP26. Because it wasn't in the interest of the people who own and control, the oil companies, gas companies, loads of the other companies that are involved in production. And it was a frustration, I think. It was a wonderful event, but there was a frustration coming out of it. What do we do now? And I think if you're serious about changing the society that we live in, then you have to begin to pose the questions of what do you actually, you have to bring your wealth and your resources into public ownership. Now, I'm not suggesting it's an overnight thing. And I'm also not suggesting that we've got all of the exact ways in which we're going to do that. But I'll tell you what, we're the most educated generation in history. So the idea that we can't work that out of how to get there is just a nonsense. And so you would have to, well, we're involved in developing a, a, a plan, a kind of map, of how to bring in, for example, energy into public ownership, how to bring transport into public ownership and make it free. How to, how to, um, the next thing you'd be looking at is things like land. You know, big tracts of land that you would bring into public ownership in Scotland and, and would be used, that's your wealth, that's your resource for the benefit of the people who actually live here and to create a sustainable Scotland as well, to create, you know, self-sufficiency in food, things like that. Now, these are big ideas, but independence is a big idea as well. And the two, for me, go hand in hand. It's, it's a once in a historical generation the opportunity to build the new nation and not a day just the same as we did before. And so we want to create the space to have those sorts of conversations. Um, we know things like community land trust work. We're in touch with people internationally. We're socialists. We're internationalists. We're in touch with people internationally. And there's all sorts of ideas coming from all over the world about what works in order to, to create prosperous societies and a better life for the people who live in them. So, but the problem we know, and this is my last point, I bet that was my seven minutes up, is the Scottish Parliament doesn't have the powers to do that. It's totally limited. The only way we're going to do that is if we get independence. And at this stage, there's what, 52, 54% in favour of independence. We need to get that up to 60, 65%. Now, it'll take many voices, but we're an integral part of that shutting the doors of working class communities in Porso and places like that and saying free public transport, housing will be of a right in our constitution. No one will live in poverty. We can use these resources. We're a wealthy nation. And convincing people, one, that they should support yes, but two, to commit and vote. Because the, the yes vote was highest in all the working class areas. I must, I'm Because I was in Glasgow, I thought we were going to win. I, I, I'm balanced about elections. I've lost more elections than I've had talked dinners, by the way. And, but I was convinced we were going to win this. And it's because we shifted Glasgow. We shifted people from the beginning to the end of that campaign. And there's a real possibility to do that again. But we need people to commit and vote. And that's where we can get in and persuade people in working class communities and most deprived areas as well, that they should join in with this movement because it's theirs, belongs to them. And they'll be important as well as everybody else in building a new society post india So that's what we're hoping for. Thank you. Okay, Gavin, are you wanting to say a few words and then I've got some questions? Well, I've got one. Aye, uh, thanks, Francis, and uh, thanks for having us on. 
Um, just touching on what Francis was speaking about there, I, I grew up in a really deprived area in the Govan. Um, I've moved to, all across Glasgow, um, stayed in Kingsbury Court, uh, stayed Ibrox, Govan, South Nets Hill, um, and it's this sort of stuff I'm going to be speaking about just now, it just sort of resonates with what Francis was saying and the whole sort of socialist friendly movement and why people like myself are starting to get involved. So um, just a bit of a background um, as a serial. So my name's Gavin Bruce. I'm a member of Living Rent, Govan Branch, uh, and I'm currently a PhD student at JCU and I'm studying specific subcultures within Glasgow through a history of trauma and emotions. So my journey has been quite a turbulent one, as I was saying there. I was kicked out of school at 14, I joined the army at 17, and I had no formal qualification. So as you can imagine, trying to find work um, and I sort of a really deprived background in a really deprived area. Um, it, was, it was made even more difficult with the fact of having no qualifications. So after joining the army and serving for seven years, um, I moved to Norway. I lived there for two years and I returned to home again to find basically the same situation. There was very few jobs available. It didn't really matter about my my life experience and um, just the fact that zero qualifications and the fact that obviously things like my accent we addressed and we I spoke didn't really help either. So thankfully due to obviously the public funding public funded education system that we have and um, I was able to turn back into education um, and turn my life around a bit. So I did my degree, I did my master's degree and then I, I won a scholarship to start this PhD um, which covers living expenses and things like that. So although um, I'm now which, in an area which is historically obviously middle class. Um, I've did, did and seen plenty uh, in my life uh, to make me realise that we can have a bigger and better nation, not just in a global stage, uh, but especially for those um, those people within it who until now have not really had a voice, people like myself who, who were sort of a victim to this system that we live under. So some of the experience I was lucky enough to have um, opened my eyes to the world and obviously the place I call home, Scotland here. Um, so I've travelled a fair bit around and I've seen firsthand the inequality in places like Kenya, Afghanistan, um, same sort of thing that's happening in Ukraine just now at the moment. Um, much of this, obviously, what I've seen previously was a product of the British and American imperialism we all came to shudder about. Um, so when I came home, I realised that right in front of me was obviously the same inequality. It was in the hands of the same imperialism and the same ruling classes. So the same ruling classes, obviously, have been in Westminster and they've ruled over Scotland since the Union's inception. So a lot of people might say, oh, well, what, what inequality? But ultimately, poverty is relative. And here in Glasgow, having lived it, um, traditionally, they've been known as the poor man of Europe, the sick man of Europe. According to a UN study in 2005, the murder capital of Europe, and now we're the drug capital of Europe, so they say. So... I mean, we also have our own Glasgow effect. And tell me another place in the UK or Europe has got its own fucking effect. Um, it's unheard of. So there's not really any comparisons you can make across the UK or beyond, um, which obviously is an issue within Scotland. And we've got to look at the reasons why Scotland is suffering, especially places like Glasgow. Um, and if you look closer, it's obviously the most impoverished, the poor and lower working classes who make up these numbers. And... Although obviously I'm speaking about imperialism, it would be quite ignorant or naive to suggest that Scotland's never played a role in this whatsoever. Um, and I feel this even more so when I look around the schemes I'm from, like Govan, Govan Insurance, Govan Hall, um, and other places across the south side where I've, I've become familiar with. You look at a lot of the families who've been displaced because of this imperialism coming from the countries I've, I've mentioned already. And so I feel like Scotland, we need to own some of this as well because owning it and understanding it makes obviously for a better future uh, of unity and trust as well. But that said, I believe we see that every day in Scotland. Um, these people who have come here to flee war and terror are simply just seeking a better life. Many now, I feel, or they feel part of Scotland and essentially have become sort of brothers and sisters um, of Scotland, regardless of their origins. So... I feel that this is why when we talk of independence, we need to keep in mind who is at the root of these problems and who created these issues for them and the working class born here. So we see it at Westminster level, and we see obviously these upper classes also in Scotland of Scottish descent. So there must be a greater realisation that those we cannot go hand in hand ultimately into a new dawn, side by side with these same ruling classes. 
to inflict such horrors abroad, but also within our own country here. So a lot of, ask a lot of people around the schemes. Um, many, it doesn't matter if they're politicised or class conscious, they still see the hypocrisy. It's rich Scottish people arguing with rich English people about what is best for the poor working class of either country. So we need to be free for the chains of Westminster. And I, I believe it will be a catalyst for more, to be honest. I believe there's a greater consciousness, um, a better representation for more would-be states across Europe to follow in our footsteps. Independence, I feel, will be in name only unless we're able to liberate the poor working class of this country as well. And um, These people who for too long have been ignored and shunned. And it's often because we're seen to have sort of low water turnout, so it seems as if we're not really a, a population that needs addressed. And I feel this is where Socialists for Independence come in. We want to speak for everybody. We want to speak for the, the poor, um, the exploited, those who suffer the most. Um, because ultimately, it's, it's those people who make it possible to have the sick man of Europe, the poor man of Europe, the drug addict city of Europe, um, and obviously the Glasgow effect. Because as I say, this is the people who are affected most by such things. So in the new dawn, when we do achieve independence, which I believe that we will achieve independence, as Francis says there, Glasgow overturning, overcoming sort of historic sort of rejection of independence Scotland for people in Glasgow. I think there was a lot of strides made with that. Um, but I do believe that to make it happen, we do also need to provide those with no voice, with a voice, not just for them, but beside them. Um, because if we are one nation, um, then we can't be alienating those who've suffered the most under the union rule and under the chauvinistic and dehumanising capitalist system. So I just want to say thanks for having us on. And um, that's it. Cheers. Okay. Thanks very much, Gavin. Um, I've got a couple of questions here from um, Indie Live, and then if anyone wants to just go into the reactions and put your hand up or just wave or um, put a question in the chat, I can read it out for you. So first up, we have Julie on Indie Live saying, do you think Scotland will vote yes at the end of 2023 or will it be too late by then because Westminster will have had time to decimate us? Does anyone want to answer that? <laughs> And what do you think? Um, actually, I think that, well, I hope, first of all, that we're going to have a referendum at the end of 2023. And I think if if Westminster refuses it once the legislation's passed, I think it's time for a little bit of mass campaigning and mass civil disobedience. And the thing about Socialist for Indy members is we've done this before. Not a lot of days we're all involved in communities and the poll tax and stuff like that. So number one, I think we need to be prepared for that. Number two, I, I do think so. I, I mean, I, I, I'm no complacent, right? But I think when you look at what people want, I suppose that there is a, an issue about um, hope and stability. And I think we what might happen economically in the next period, I mean, we're not even talking about the impact on the world economy and Ukraine and all of that at the minute. But I think the impact in Scotland won't be, oh goodness, let's let's cling to the UK because things are so bad, we need to stay there. I think the opposite will be the case. I think people are going to think, you know what, independence can be worse than this. And independence is an opportunity to change things. And so I actually think that there's a possibility there in the next few years, like the stuff about energy is, is an example of that. You know, Scottish Power, owned by a Spanish multinational, whose profits go to the Qatari Wealth Fund, putting the argument that, you know, France owns its, its energy and they're getting a 4% rise. They've got public energy. I think those sorts of arguments will really, really resonate in the period that we're going into. So I, I'm optimistic. What do you think? Who was the questioner? Have you got reservations? It's, on, it's, a, it's a message from oh, is it a message? Well, you can put them on the chat. I mean, what do other people think? Do you think that we're ready for the end of 2020? Does anyone want to come in there? Uh, well, <clears throat> we certainly need to get moving kind of quick once we've got a date to work towards. So, um, we took a while warming up, uh, although you're right about uh, how we managed to turn over uh, the the yes 
uh, the no to yeses and the, the schemes and communities, etc. and the Indy F1. It took a while to warm up. Uh, we really need to get hit the ground running this time. Um, you know, and there's things that, you know, um, yeah, we need to get a uh, turnout up in the communities because uh, it's all very well folks saying they're going to vote yes, but we know folk in Newton Merns or wherever that are no voters are going to go out. 90% of them are going to go out and vote. So you have to have voter registration starting a lot earlier than it did the last time uh, and let people know that they have to turn out and vote. I think these things are crucial. But if we can hit the ground running uh, and get a bit of impetus in the campaign, early doors, uh, you know, I'd fully expect to win. Um, you know, it'd be crazy not to win. The way, yeah. <laughs> since given what happened since 2014. I think you young people can fool, are much You can fool folk once, but you know, can't you fool them twice? I think the other thing we've got in our favour, and I don't want you to film it this bad, I think the other thing we've got in our favour is young people. I mean, I, I've taught politics since I came into Parliament in 2000, or started in 2008, and see, before the NDF, young people weren't interested in politics. It was like drawing teeth, they were like, whoosh, and they had to come to my class because they never had the choice, they had to do it. They all wanted to be psychologists and forensic psychologists because they all the crime shows and all that. Oh, sorry, 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 students, I didn't mean that. But after 2014, politics became cool. It became sexy. Loads of young people are interested in it. They've joined political parties. They've joined the cop type movements. And I just thought, wow, what an explosion of interest. And I think this time around, I think, young people are much, much more likely to be actively involved in the street than they were the last time. And for people, it's my age group, it's the problem, right, to convince people, women of my age of the demographic, that's the problem. But I think those young people will add the dynamism to the movement that we didn't have in the same way the last time. Sorry. Okay. Um, I've, just, I've got some questions to read out before I take people that have got their hands up, if that's all right. Um, William from Indy Live is saying, uh, do you think the Yes movement should follow the Socialist Party and get out on sorry, on the east end of Princess Street? So I, I think that might be... <laughs> in, in... Uh, all I'm going to say is I'm not on the east end of Princess Street, right? Still in the paper. <laughs> nobody in Socialist for Indy is going to do that, right? It's not going to happen. Okay. Um, so, Teresa, you want me to read that one out in the chat? Yeah, I can't seem to get oh, the right. hands up. Do you know what I mean? I blame him. He set this up. But, well, you can just um, say yeah. it if you want. Do you want to well, I'm just saying that, um, I mean, I can, you know, I'm quite happy to say that I'm, I've already joined the Socialist for Indy and, you know, just a little bit of my journey. You can hear I'm English, can't you? But, um, you know, labour all my life, as most people in Glasgow were, and kind of not so sure about this independence. But once once I was convinced in 2014, you know, as part of the local yes in this area and been into Govan Hill and absolutely what Francis has said, it was the idea of an, another way of being for Scotland that we don't have to live like this anymore. That was what made people go out and vote, I think. You know, it wasn't just the, I mean, obviously, you know, Scotland's got the right to decide. And if it decides it wants to have a Tory party running it, that's the, that's the right of Scotland. But that's not what's going to get people out. If that's what you believed, you would just stay in the union, wouldn't you? But um, so I think, I think Socialist Friendly is very important in getting that vote out. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I've joined it. But I'm a bit concerned about how uh, there's so much fighting within the yes movement and I was hoping to hear from Francis and Gavin about how you can how we can cut across all that and how we can because that's the problem isn't it when you see a disunited campaign and people are fighting each other that's that's one of the things that puts people off as well isn't it you know because they're too busy fighting each other you know can we do something that's going to cut across all that and just present a united front because it was pretty united and in the 2014 wasn't it you know we all got together and yeah 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 you'd say that was true yeah 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 mm -hmm. Thanks, yes. glad you're both in agreement in the same living room 
<laughs> I don't know if Gavin wants to come. One of the things that socials for India is, you know what, it's got people from the Labour Party, the Green, the SNP, and the Socialist Party, and who else? So, anyway, those parties. And um, I think that, and you know what, there's differences, all right? That, 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 and, and that's cool. We're cool about that. People have got different views on, on a whole number of things. But our emphasis is working together on what we agree on. And I think if we can bring that culture to the Yes Movement, which was there the last time, then you cut across a lot of that. I mean, I don't know what most Yes groups would think of people in the Labour Party, you know, joining them. I'm sure there's not many at the moment because they're not allowed to be that public. But there is a lot of people in the Labour Party or Labour supporters who actually support independence. And the thing is, there's nowhere for them to go, right? They're not going to join the SNP. And very few of them are, some of them might, but they're going to join the Greens. So where do they go? And I think creating that space where we're not treating them as kind of traitors for still being in the Labour Party, I think is really, really important. I think that that attitude towards people, to, including people who don't agree at this stage, to bring them much closer to us is really important. And I think we've all got a responsibility on social media as well, by the way, to behave in a way that that allows us respect and the opportunity to have that discussion. But I think once a campaign is launched, I think a lot of that division will be overcome. I think part of it's the frustration that nothing's happened. And we're still waiting. Mm. Sorry, Gavin, I'll let you answer the next one. I was going to say, in terms of that, I think it's important, obviously, for certain groups, focusing the groups that they are they're interested in. Um, obviously, we are going to be looking at sort of the working class um, and the schemes and things like that. Well, my, the people I'm going to be speaking to, especially when it's part of living rent, when I'm chatting doors and things like that, is the stuff that I'll be discussing just in general anyway, sort of getting an idea of their positions. I think it's important for people in their, their groups, in their areas, they, they really get out there and, and do it. And that, that's, that's going to be the main focus, irrespective of if other people see a different direction of independence happening. If we do want independence, that's got to be the main thing. That's got to be the sort of the road that we've got to take each and every one of us. However, I've, I've said to Francis numerous times, my biggest fear is that we get independence and we just end up in another, another state, um, just, like, just like United Kingdom, but for the sort of power and sort of Holyrood, but absolutely zero of it going towards the working class. So I think obviously we need to go out there, we need to get representation, but also need to get people fighting alongside us. And this is Malcolm suggested there, we need to be getting more representation for people in the schemes. We need to get voter turnout. We need to get those people fighting and speaking for themselves um, because ultimately it's their struggle as well. So I, I think that although there's the, the sort of divisions within the Yes movement, I think that's easily overcome again just by going out, speaking to your sort of usual demographics um, and just getting them involved. And obviously when you're doing that, you're branching out. If you know your, you know your stuff that you're talking about, you're going to be able to sort of change minds that way. I see quite a lot of people getting shot down online. As Francis says, this is quite common. Uh, instead of just sort of engaging in discussion, people are just shooting them down and making it as if they're stupid. We've already seen it, the, the, the sort of how that turns out. When we start making people out to be stupid, they turn to extremes. And that's how you got the likes of Trump and things like that. All these people for so long that were called stupid. They didn't have a voice. They're like, ah, you're not, your voice doesn't matter. We don't want them to turn to extremes. We want to turn their heads. We want to turn their, change their minds. So they're fighting for us and they're fighting for the right side. Um, and that's the point, obviously. So I, I feel that we can, we can overcome the sort of conflict between us um, to get to yes, but it's the what we're going to do with yes. We, we get that's my, my biggest. Um, so I, I've got, not got an answer for it either, but that's my, my position anyway. Great, thanks. Uh, Craig, you want to come in there? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, just just to go back to one of the original questions, I hope there will be uh, an independence referendum uh, by the end of uh, 2023. Because I fear very much that if there isn't, the trajectory of this uh, Westminster government is increasingly authoritarian. It's increasingly, uh, you know, with the, the legislation that's been passed, 
uh, regarding protests and, and so on, the appalling uh, borders bill that is going through Parliament at the moment just about epitomises what this government's about. Uh, and, and we can see it too in the way that uh, they have uh, been absolutely heartless uh, until forced anyway by public opinion to make some minor changes as far as I can see uh, with the, uh, dealing with Ukrainian refugees as well. So, yeah, I, I really hope that happens. And if it does, Malcolm's absolutely right. You know, it's important that we hit the ground running. And I think we're in a position to do that. And the, I, I was um, really interested in uh, what Francis was saying, uh, because if we're going to hit the, the, the road running, we need to have a vision, don't we? We need to have no truck, I think, with this notion of, you know, keep quiet for independence and so on. We do need a vision that engages working class communities and uh, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the freedom map that you talked about, because that sounded a very interesting uh, thing and, and the way that you're um, actually uh, sort of developing that map uh, in terms of, you know, what, what I think you mentioned, housing and uh, concrete issues like that, uh, because those are all going to be centrally important if we're going to uh, get, uh, uh, you know, do, do what we did last time and really engage with working class people and with young people as well, because presumably you have... Uh, ideas about uh, about how we engage them too. Definitely. I mean, I, I think there's two things. I think there's activism on the ground. That there's two things we need to do at the one time. We've not got anything to chat doors about at the moment, you know, because we can't say, well, this is what we're going to do. But there are a lot of other issues that are affecting working class people. I mean, it's, People. I live in public houses still in a housing association and also in my rents went up massively over the past five, six, seven years. Honestly, it's shocking. It's been up nearly 100%. And my energy bill, uh, my, my normal energy, telling me something, was £120 for both. I got big ceiling. And my new one is £255. I'm like, what? You're kidding me on? <laughs> now, I was thinking, if this is happening to me, Everybody else must be in the same boat, my fixed champion and end. So I think there's other issues that, that, that we have to develop. And so there's fighting and we're going to have to, we'll, we'll be involved. People on social for independence are involved in community stuff, trade union stuff, living rent, Gavin's involved in, um, save the libraries, all of these sorts of campaigns as well. So although we're a network of socialists, the activism that people have got is in different areas and then it comes together. And where it comes together on the freedom map, that's a great idea. I never said that, but that's a brilliant idea, by the way. We should call it that. The freedom map is we're intending to hold a number of socialist summits. Let me go back a step. See, before we got the Scottish Parliament, there was a constitutional convention. And the constitutional convention campaigned for a kind of blueprint of what the Scottish Parliament and devolution would look like, what powers it should have, whether it should be PR, whether it should be 50-50, gender balanced, which got defeated, by the way. Um, there was a whole load of stuff. But that was a kind of map to get a Scottish Parliament. So by the time they introduced the legislation, Donald Dewar introduced the legislation, there was already a framework of what this Parliament was going to look like, what powers it was going to have, committee system, all that sort of stuff. And I think we need to kind of take that on board a bit. And so while we're actually winning the argument, we're developing a freedom map for after it. So we, this year, we were hoping to organise a summit on energy, a summit on transport, a social summit in energy, a social summit in transport, and a social summit in land. Because if you want to own it, you have to understand how it works. You need to know where does, what's, what energy is produced in this country. Who owns it? How is it this nonsense about the retail stuff? How is it delivered? Um, how would you transform it? What would you do about the national grid? All those sorts of questions. Is it community energy versus, you know, centralised energy production? We need to understand it. We need to understand land and we need to understand what the mother one, transport. And so there's loads and loads of people in the movement and loads of people who are socialists who've got loads of knowledge about that. Now, I don't have detailed knowledge about the oil industry, but I know a man who does. And so we're hoping to bring that expertise together 
And then next year, we were hoping to have one on a socialist summit on democracy, a socialist summit on a constitution, and something else that I can't remember, right? But that idea of the reason Social Frenzy was, was created was to win, win support and working class communities, but was also to create a space for socialists to come together in different parties, but to begin to discuss concretely how you would move in that direction and also learning internationally. There's loads of people around the world who are doing stuff like this already. You know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel everywhere. And so that's what we're hoping to do. And it means when you're on the doorstep, and you're knocking the door, you can actually say, well, this is possible here. He said it's going to happen. And I think that's what we would definitely bring to the movement in terms of campaigning. So anybody who wants to be involved, there'll be advertised at the public, and I know everybody taking part in them wouldn't necessarily be members of Social Sprinty. It's about creating that space. Just need to organise them now. <laughs> We've got the date of the first one, 21st of May, the Social Summit and Energy. Just need to get it by it. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a few questions from uh, Indie Live. Um, they're all quite different, so if, will I just take them one at a time? Um, so Callum saying, should we dissolve Holyrood and reconstitute the suspended Scottish Parliament? I don't know if Gavin wants to take that one. Gavin did politics and then ditched it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. No, yeah. you're on mute anyway. But you take it, Francis, to the politics. <laughs> That's it for history, but you want to put it in. Um, I think we're going to constitute a Scottish Parliament and an independent nation. I think the big question, an independent nation state parliament, I think there's a lot of questions before we get there about what, what's that going to look like. I mean, I'm not sure I would want to go to the old Scottish Parliament with the men in the knee breeches and the buckles and the shoes and the frills and all that. Having said that, that still exists in Westminster. There's still people walking about like that, by the way, and expect us to treat them seriously. Um, so I think we, would, we need a discussion about, I want a, a Scottish Parliament again, but what does it look like? We could really look to a modern Parliament. What would the modern Parliament look like? And how would people and citizens have access to that? And the Scottish Parliament, this one, the devolution one, was first um, created. The idea was to let the people in. Now, what's happened since then is keep the people out. It's actually not materialised the way we hoped it had. So we've got an opportunity to have a second bite at the cherry, I think. Thanks. Um, Age of Aquarius has said, um, has asked, Francis said that there is a place for SNP and Greens, but what makes her say that when there has been a pro indie majority for years? And they still sit on their hands. <laughs> Good question. Is it not? I think there is there is an issue of timing. I'm not letting anybody off the hook, and I think there's a huge frustration that we haven't had the opportunity to have another independence referendum. And did they not pass the legislation just before COVID? I think the Scottish Parliament did pass the legislation. Now, and we're on their way to asking to, to because of the Scotland Act 1999, which is respond, which is still got the powers in constitutional affairs, then they would have to send it to Westminster. I've wondered about this as well because Britain's got an unwritten constitution. Anyway, um, who, who says Westminster decides whether we get it or not? And also, most of our bills don't go via Westminster; they go to the Queen. So. The thing going to, what's going to happen in between us, the Scottish Parliament passing it and then the next process. But Westminster could either just ignore it or they could, they could go to the Supreme Court. Anyway, I'm off topic. Do I think they've been sitting in their hands? I think there is a frustration about that and I feel it too. So I think we really need the legislation by the end of autumn or beginning of next year. We'll see. And we did have COVID. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, Anita has asked, what are you planning if there is no referendum next year? Um, well, as I said, the people who are involved in Socialists for Independence are involved in a lot of other things. So 
it's only one place where people are active. So people who are in the care sector of their unions will be presumably organising for industrial action and balloting for industrial action again on pay. Those who work in the NHS and our union reps will be no doubt organising that. Gavin and Living Rent will be, I don't want to speak for Gavin, he'll be doing, he can tell you what he's going to do in Living Rent. Um, so Disney stock is arguing for one, a change in society, but also Disney stop us from being active in struggles that are for to, to try and improve all our lives, particularly those who are at the lowest incomes and live in the, the worst housing or are experiencing poverty. So we'll still all be doing that. And it is a strength for us to come together. Because sometimes you're an activist, you can be like a bit like, am I, am I fighting this again? Whereas if you've got other people that you're fighting alongside, it makes a big, big difference. I don't know what you're going to be doing in Living Rent Garden. Well, just the usual, just uh, organising, door chapping, um, getting about trying to sort of organise people against obviously the, the landlords, against the councils, and doing direct actions. But I think this, as you say, that although independence is, is our aim, but we're socialists as well. I mean, I, I consider myself a socialist first um, before any nationality, um, and a national um, socialist as well. So. The struggle for us obviously never stops. We're involved in stuff day to day. Um, for us who are obviously living beside it, there's no escaping it either. So although people, a lot of people travel different areas just to go and get involved in, in actions, as I say, a lot of us actually live it well, day to day. Um, thankfully, I've, I've not had to get involved in it too much lately just because I've, I've had different focuses. But now the summer's coming up again, having a bit of spare time, that's when all my energy is going to be put into this. And especially now, we're seeing the, the fuel hikes. Um, so you're seeing your, your petrol, diesel, gas, electric. Um, I mean, we're not seeing any drops in sort of bus fares or we're not seeing any drops in train fares either. Um, so all this kind of I mean, wages obviously stagnating, rents are going up. I mean, rents are through the roof, as Francis was saying. So ultimately, these are our struggles that are still going on. And the more we're obviously speaking to these people and saying that, well, nationalisation, um, it, it would be, play a huge part in that, with, with overcoming these sort of rises and big hikes. So if I'm going to door to door, I'm going to ask, well, why, are you, why is your landlord able to do this? Why is these councils able to do this? We've got no power. So it's about taking power back for the working class. Once you start putting that sort of class consciousness into people, they start looking at the bigger picture and they're going, well, maybe it's systemic. Maybe we need to start changing things as a whole, as a, as a country, as a nation. Um, and I, I feel that Although we're more focusing directly on independence, we're still sort of set plant the seeds for people when we're speaking to them. So it's all it's all intertwined. Ultimately, the, the for me, the independence struggle is a class struggle as well. So I don't think it ever stops, regardless if we're fighting for the independence campaign to get it and um, to get the vote. We're still fighting for the people to turn to our side on it. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got another question here. Uh, Faye. Do you think the sanction of different opinions will kick in when we do go for independence? I think the sanction, stop, stopping different opinions in the movement, asking people not to... Maybe, aye. Um, I don't know. I don't think it happened the last time, you know. I think the Yes movement, people were free. I spoke in, I'm a socialist. And I spoke in platforms with business for independence and trade unions for independence and women for independence and all, all sorts of different um, views. And it was actually quite easy to say, well, I remember yeah, over there and um, thinks this is the type of independence we should have. And we're having this is, I don't necessarily agree with that. And here's the type of independence I think we should have. But until we both agree that until we get independence, then we're not going to have the power to actually decide what kind of country that we want. So during that period, there was national collect there was all sorts of ideas that were represented, I think, on platforms and in yes meetings and community halls. So see back to that last question, see next year, whether independence is, is on the agenda or not. I think for us. We're going to, not this, next year, this coming year, we're going to have to be involved in campaigns anyway to try and get the Tory government to either do price caps on basic essentials and food, price cap on energy. 
And I think we need to be involved across the UK, but, but in Scotland, we need to try and build a movement that's fighting for that type of uh, policy. But, but that's a whole a whole other issue. But it does need, once people have moved into action in that, it's much easier to get a political discussion about independence because it opens up a whole lot of questions that people are trying to, trying to answer. But anyway, I'm not sure, but if it does, if there is this clampdown, and where would it come from? I mean, would it come from the SNP, the Greens, the leadership in the Yes movement? I'm not, I'm not even sure where, where people might think that might come from. But if it does, I don't think it's going to work. I think the grassroots is going to say no, we can work together, as we did the last time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Malcolm? Uh, just coming back on that last point, I mean, the last uh, referendum, of course, we had the, white, the Scottish government's white paper. Uh, there was some good stuff in it, but uh, in any group I was involved in, uh, I don't think anyone was arguing for the white paper going round the doors. You were arguing for what you believed in uh, and what you could achieve in an independent Scotland. And uh, I don't think that's going to change. I think everyone can have their own vision. Uh, and you know things can only get better in my opinion you know but we, we have to be able to frame the type of society we want you know I think Mary Black who's a SNP MSP said she never campaigned in the white paper <laughs> she just ignored it so I think there's, there's scope for the rest of us to say things like that as well yeah Okay, I don't have any more questions as now. Is anyone anything you want to say? No. Nope. Um, in the chat, I've put Yes Outside's email account if you don't already have it. If you want to email us, um, if you want us to send you out um, activities and updates that we have. So is it over to you then, Malcolm? Okay, Jane, thanks very much. Um, well, you know, I really appreciate uh, Francis and Gavin taking the time out to to join us this evening. Uh, it was certainly good to hear what they had to say, and some quite uh, uh, quite inspiring ideas about getting things um, moving um, in communities. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'll be glad to be out campaigning with you shortly, hopefully, um, and. Uh, you know, thanks everyone for coming along tonight. Uh, on the, those who are on the Zoom meeting and those who are watching us in live stream, um, you can uh, their catch up will be available for anyone. Um, hopefully, you can recommend it uh, to your friends. Um, and uh, we'll have be having another Zoom meeting shortly. We don't have a, the speaker lined up yet, but people on the Facebook um, page or our mailing list. I'll uh, get details of the next Zoom meeting, so please uh, respond to Jane's email that she's put in the, the uh, chat so you'll get contacted. And you'll also be contacted with updates on Yes Southside campaigning, which we have been campaigning. Um, the weather's been pretty crap, as we all know, since, <laughs> since the new year. Uh, but we have managed out the last couple of Saturdays, and hopefully... Uh, we'll be we'll be uh, able to ramp that up uh, over the next few months, uh, particularly when we get a when we ha do have a date we're working towards. I'm sure we'll be seeing lots of you out on the streets. So please keep in touch, and we'll hope to see you soon. And lastly, thanks again to Jane for your usual efficient self and uh, mm -hmm. handling the the uh, live streaming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also to Kevin. Uh, at Indie Live for uh, being good enough to to um, participate in this. So uh, have a good evening, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Okay, cheers. Thanks. Thanks very yeah. much. Thanks. Bye. Everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye. And thanks, Indie Live. Cheers. Thank Bye. You.